actually our last session of GDC and uh, here at the Bev House. And this is a session that I'm actually particularly happy to have here. Not only because they're from Barcelona, but actually both Horacio and Andres, I don't know if you knew that, but we went to the same school. Yes, <laughs> UPC. So this is the UPC power actually. So I'm very happy uh, being in the gaming industry for, for so long. I'm very happy um, to have one of the key successes that we've had in our very own city of Barcelona. Social Point um, started on Facebook and did a, a very successful transition onto mobile. And we're going to be talking about all that transition, all that growth throughout different titles. And last year, uh, Social Point was acquired by, by Take Two, so a traditional console. Uh, company, a public company. So to tell us everything from the beginnings till the till today, I'm extremely happy to have Horacio and Andres. Please help me welcome on stage. Perfect. Hi. It, this is a cozy stage. <laughs> How are you guys doing? Very good. I didn't know you were at UPC. Yes, 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 yes. I was researching you guys and I realized you're a computer uh, science engineer. I'm a mechanical engineer. The real engineer. Uh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, anyways, well, let, let's, let's kick it off at the beginning. How did you guys meet? How did you guys start, uh, decided to start a gaming company? So we met that uh, the second year in the, in the university. We were studying that computer science, and and the thing is, after four years of studying computer science, we're a little bit tired of programming. And Andres had the nice idea of uh, making a master of entrepreneurship in France in a in a in a kind of a business school. No? And we went there. We studied one year. We had a lot of fun. And there we had the idea of creating a, a game. And Facebook arrived to France, it was 2008, and we saw the opportunity to start uh, our game directly in Facebook because of the opportunity of the virality and to make uh, something social. So when we came back from Spain, we finished uh, our studies in the university, we started the, the game, we launched it, and we were uh, happily or surprisingly successful, and that's why we started the social point. Cool, and, and tell us about, more about the idea of the game. I mean, what was it, uh, and, and how did you come up with, with it? In fact, the, the idea of the game was, a, was the advertising game. So it was called Public Stars. It was only, only available for the Spanish community. But the idea behind was we want to make advertising more funny, and we want to make an adver an, a game about advertising. So the idea was you start watching a spot, and you have to guess which is the brand behind that spot. No? And the idea behind that we had is that we are willing that big brands are going to pay to appear inside our games. Uh, and that worked, but it was very difficult to scale right? because it was a B2B business. Uh, and with that, we were already on Facebook, and then it's when we started creating other kinds of social games. Cool. And you're both obviously with a technical background, uh, a little bit of business education, and you guys decided to start a company and call yourselves co CEOs. Who makes the decisions at the end? <laughs> he works. I'm all the day in the beach in Barcelona. <laughs> all right, all right. I like, I like that. Split responsibilities. <laughs> no, but mainly, I mean, there is a lot of work. No? I mean, and in, in all the companies, fund, funding and creating a company is a lot of work. So basically, there is enough work for two co CEOs. No? It's a strange model, and many, many, many people ask, but it worked for us. And basically, we divided in games and projects. Initially, I was more in charge of the live games, and of course, Horatio is more athletic guy, I'm more the boring guy. Uh, but nowadays, we, we split more or less games and different departments. I think it happened naturally. Um, when we started, I was the client developer, he was the backend developer, so, you know, both things were important, so I was exactly the same type. And when the company grew a little, uh, there was a lot of things going on, and we never discussed about the roles. We tried to do as much as we can individually, no? And, and then one day we realized that we were a 20 people's company and that both of us we were co-CEOs. And we said, it's fine, yeah, okay, let's keep it like that. And after on, when the company has kept growing, we try to divide the departments depending on our experience or our skills. And this, for example, it's much better with the numbers and making money, and that's why he has been more in charge on the live ops. And I was 
maybe a little bit better on the creative side and I started some new games. But at the end, both of us, we have done a lot of different things and it was easy for us to, to share the, the role and the responsibilities. Perfect. Um, so, so we were mentioning you, you guys started on Facebook, you saw the opportunity to start there. Um, fast forward, um, how did you get to Dragon City, right? Uh, which was kind of the big mega hit uh, from social point. How did you get there? And let's start talking about the transition towards mobile and, and, and tapping into the app store. So when we were at Facebook, we had to build our game strategy several times because we were not uh, reaching to have a lot of revenues. But uh, finally, after making casual games and growing a lot of volume of users that not in revenues, we decided to make our first free-to-play game, which was called Social Empires. It's kind of our version, our take of Age of Empires in Facebook at this time. The game went really, really successful uh, because at this time there were only farm builds and let's say more simple uh, simulation games. And when we did a uh, kind of Age of Empires, or Social Empires, where you had to control the units and attack other castles and things, people get really engaged. And the first live or the first content that we did that went really successful was launching a dragon. So the first dragon that we launched was a red fire dragon, super ugly, when I see it right now, but super fun at this time. It sold really well, like whatever, $2,000 or $5,000 in a day, it was okay, but it's a lot of money with this dragon. Then we started to launching several dragons in the game. And like one year, yeah, two years after, when we decided to create a, a new game, we decided to make a game totally focused on dragon. We saw the rhythm mechanic out there. We were also fans of Pokemon, and we decided to mix the breathing mechanic with our dragons and with the fight that you can fight in, let's say, simple turn based battles like Pokemon. So, from this vision, we created Dragon City in three months, uh, super fast, yeah, with a really small team. Obviously, not with all the content that we have right now in a simple version. We will launch it on Facebook and really fast. We saw that the KPIs were good and we will start to make marketing and to make the game grow. So. Happen everything so fast. Let me ask, we, we like numbers. What does it mean the KPIs were good? <laughs> good retention, good lifetime value, and the curve of DAUs going like that. All right, all right. And then, I mean, how did you see the opportunity of the App Store coming, and, and at what point did you decide, okay, uh, it's time to move on to the new platform? So it was a kind of natural trend because we were kind of forced to do that movement because obviously the Facebook games peaked uh, back in 2010 or 11, I think, and then everyone was starting moving into, into mobile. No? Uh, and then one day we said, okay, we need to move all our games into mobile. No? And from one day to another, we start creating uh, Dragon City Mobile. And so we got all the engineers that were working on the Flash version of the, of the Facebook game. We hired a couple of key experts on C++ and iOS development, and we did that transition. It took to create Dragon City Mobile, it was a little bit longer, it took, uh, I think, seven to eight months to create and to launch it. Yeah. All right, so, so you're talking about, in that transition, you had to hire probably new talent. Um, was it a big transformation? Are we talking about growing the team dramatically, or did you reuse a lot of the resources that you had deployed previously on Facebook into, into this new platform? Well, we, we did both. We reduced everyone that was working on the Flash games, uh, well, I think almost everyone, uh, transition into, into C++. Uh, and then we hired like, a, I don't know, it was maybe 10 to 15 mobile developers by that time, in order that they helped to all the rest of the team to be able to make the transition. That was around 2012, 2013, you said? We launched, so we started the development of Dragon City in 2012, and we launched in early 2013. 2013. Cool. What, I mean, that, that was your, your first step into the app store. What has changed? I mean, it, just taking mobile, uh, uh, Dragon City mobile, what has changed in the life cycle of that app, and how have you seen the audience uh, change on the app store since, since 2013? So everything has changed and nothing has changed. No? At the end, uh, everything is about uh, having a great game in which uh, people get really hooked and really engaged, and then if they have more fun, they are more willing to play. But uh, the way that the games works, or, or the, the way that we operate now games, it's really different than the way that we operated uh, uh, five years ago. So Dragon City is now a five years old game, and it keeps uh, having a, a really good performance level and pretty stable since the last three years. 
And in order to do that, uh, obviously, uh, every year, in a natural way, you have less DAUs. No? It's, it's difficult, especially for games that they have a lot of DAUs, to keep them uh, many, many years. And what you have to find the formula is the ones that you have, they have to be more engaged, and you have to find ways to monetize them higher. No? So we have seen this industry, this trend in the industry, especially since the last two years, that almost all the companies and all the games, they are building how to monetize better the users. And this is because at the end, the games are becoming much better. So if we compare the Dragon City 2015 and the Dragon City now, everything is different. The onboarding is different, the graphics are different, the battle is different. So we need to really evolve and change every key aspect of the game in order to make it still appealing for the user. So it, everything is still about, uh, about creating the best games, having the pretensions, having the monetizations, but the way that the companies they achieve that right now it has changed to the way that they, they were achieving before. Right. And uh, obviously at some point you, you, you decide to be diversify and you need to drive innovation within your portfolio. You build a portfolio of roughly five mobile apps that are still active on, on, on the App Store. And um, Tell us about that process of, of innovation. How do you operate? Do you operate by studios, different studios? And do you have a team continuously innovating in the next thing? Uh, how do you work internally in terms of, of product innovation and, and, and new releases versus keep working on the on the live games that you have on the app store. So today we are we are a three hundred and sixty people company, all of us based in Barcelona. We have a we work in a total of eight games. Uh, mainly we are working in Dragon City and, and Monster Legends, which are the two live games. Even if we have more, uh, we are mainly supporting those and then we are working into six new titles. No? The way how we operate is we are very product oriented and we don't have different studios officially, but in a kind of way, uh, we're in a building with 12 floors, and every half floor is one game. Uh, so at the end, we have like mini studios inside the same company, so inside social All right, and, and I guess communication and coordination internally must be key, right? Uh, they cannot work in silos. What, what functions are actually shared throughout the different studios versus uh, what, what what is unique from every every studio? So, more than on the transversal departments, mainly we have uh, marketing and analytics, and obviously all the corporate ones, no? all the corporate ones, yes. But from a product perspective, it's mainly analytics and marketing. And even if they are, they have centralized department, we have responsibles on each of those departments for for every of the game that we are working. At the end, we try to run everything like an independent startup inside social point. So, of course, they can get use of uh, uh, the advantages of being inside a bigger company. Uh, they don't have to build all their designs since the beginning, so they use uh, our marketing team or analytical team, and they get the use of all the assets that we have built before. But they decide which is the best methodology in order to develop their game, which is the size thing that they need, and we try to support them. So, that creates a I think an efficient process because we don't have to control them every day what they do. So they have their own milestones and just with a catch up once a month, we know what's going on. And if we think that uh, the game is having potential and we need to, to move to the full development cycle and to soft launch, or if not, we stop working on it and we start working on new ideas. And how many games have you killed, if any? <laughs> no, a lot of things, around 15 in the last seven years. Not bad. And in different stages. Some yeah. of them prototypes, but some of them pretty plans. Yeah. A post soft launch and everything. A post soft launch, I would say it's seven. Oh. Build, uh, seven games. Okay. Okay. T tell us a little bit more about that. I, I mean, many, many, we may have indie developers deciding is this a viable product or should I still invest more resources on this game or should I just kill it and focus on the next thing. Tell us a little bit more about the decision of killing a game. At what point? is inevitable and you make a firm decision to focus on the next thing. So there is, I think, two reasons why um, normally we decide to, to stop working in a game after the soft launch. And the first one is that when you don't have uh, good KPIs uh, and uh, you have not seen a positive evolution in the last months, that's a signal that maybe there is something that you are not able to fix it or you don't find a way. But the second one and the most important is when the team starts uh, having, not having ideas about how to continue. No? So it's not the same uh, having a game that maybe you have an issue with this KPI, but you have a strong roadmap and you know what's going on, and then you can have passion when it's just a question about improving a game. But if the 
team, they don't know where they have to go. They start promoting all the time the idea and different aspects. Then it's a good moment to think, hey, are you sure you want to continue this game or would you like to prefer to start a new one? No? So at the end, everything is about the team decision, about thinking if, if by continuing working in the game, they will improve the KPIs and the game is successful or, or not. I, I remember one day having lunch in Barcelona, you shared something that really stuck in my mind, which is that you do this massive internal company all hands where you actually rent a space, I'm not sure if that's still the case, in front of you, which is a big mall, right? Which is a big auditorium. It's a cinema. Uh, it's a cinema, you actually rent a cinema. Uh, to have your, your internal all hands, um, which is, I assume, with so many studios and so many different teams, uh, almost like independent startups, I assume it's, it's the way where they get together and they connect with the vision, they connect with the, some of the learnings as well. How much post-mortems do you do uh, after having killed a game? Do they, I, I mean, is there usually a post-mortem that you can learn from? And, and is this the, the space where you share this, these insights and learnings? Some of them, yes. The most important and relevant may be yes. But every, every game team does his own postmortems by their own. And then they share with the rest of the company or with the rest of the teams via email or other, other communication forms. At, at Social Point, and we are very transparent, or we try to be, um, even if uh, the, the, the teams they are independent, they are really connected. So everybody knows the KPIs of everybody, everybody knows the revenues and all the data from the and City Constellations, and uh, they meet often once or every two weeks, uh, the different uh, experts and roles to share uh, experiences, synergies, learnings, no? because uh, at the end, this is an industry of learning fast and experimenting fast. And if you don't share the knowledge that we are creating internally, that there is no point. No? So we try to share as much information as we can, and we try to, to learn. And one thing that we are doing right now that supports very well is that all the teams, when they uh, think it's the right moment, it can be very early in the prototype or in the soft ones. They try to make all the company play, get feedback from the company, and then uh, iterate through that. No? So that's something that is uh, really positive for me. Cool. Um, when I think about you guys and, and Dragon City and Monster Legends, I personally try to characterize this. You, you guys have mastered the art of making RPG games with a cartoony face and, and with a, that actually attracts a broader audience than probably the typical super meat or hardcore RPG games, right? Um, I guess, the, would you say this is the secret for success? How do you think about genres and are you excited about new genres, diversifying beyond, beyond RPG? Uh, how do you think about, about new concepts and, and moving beyond this, this vertical? So we are excited about, so we are genre agnostic a little bit in the company, so we love RPGs, we love simulation, we love strategy, but we, we tend to focus in a couple of genres, but if we have great ideas that we want to push it, we will push it. And it's true, I mean, when you play Dragon City and Monster Legends, and especially Monster Legends, no? it's the, the onboarding, it's a very casual theme, very mass market. My mass mom could be playing Monster Legends, Legend, right? Yeah, could be playing. And, th and then afterwards it's when we introduce the RPG mechanics which add all the deepness, the richness, and, and, and makes that the game has a long attention because of that. So I think we are, in a kind of way, we mix up the, the good things of both worlds. No? I mean, being able to be mass market and also being able to have good lifetime value and good monetization KPIs to be able to scale. For me, the key thing in order to succeed in, in the mobile game space or in the gaming space in general is about uh, launching something which is unique and which, which is highly innovative. No? When we created Dragon City Monster Legends, we saw the opportunity of making a game which was a cartoon art style, more thinking on the mass market, uh, everybody can play, and with some RPG mechanics that at the end we have evolved them a lot and they have become more deep. But finding this mix, this opportunity, we, think, we thought that it was a big audience looking for these type of mixes. Um, and, and that's why the games become successful. Now probably, if we try to repeat that two or three times more, maybe it will not work, because we have already this, this audience served with the coordinates that we have. So we need to think about what, what's possible next, no? which is the, the new mix or the new flavor that we can add to the market and that can attract the, 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 the attention of, of the audience. So I think it's very important to deliver innovative experience and, and original mixes to, to the market in order to succeed. Um, let, let's switch gears a little bit and talk about revenue models. Um, your games on the App Store are mostly IAP driven, but how do you think about, about 
revenue models? How, how much importance are you giving internally to add, uh, add revenue versus, versus other revenue streams that you may be exploring? So we are, we are mainly focused on in our purchases. Uh, obviously we have ads in our games. I think it adds up 10 to 20% of the demand on the game. So we see that as a extra layer of monetization. And especially we see that as for, for the users that they are not willing to invest real money into your game, it's a good way to, to monetize them and to make them a user that, that they actually want to be profitable for us. And that, that, does that 10 to 20% vary a lot from country to country? Do you see big discrepancies or big differences between the IAP, the in a purchase ratio compared to the ad revenue portion? portion? I, I don't know exactly. I think it, it depends more where there is enough inventory and where not. So probably in TRA countries it's where you have more inventory and that it's better paid not compared to other countries. Um, you guys were one of the first gaming company that I know that started being professional about influencer marketing. Um, we, we had a, a session earlier today to talk about these and, and actually with Medis, uh, a China-based uh, company. Um, how did you start connecting with creators? And um, I mean, you have a team dedicated fully to that. And I think Andres, you've been personally very involved in it as well. Can you tell us a little bit more about how important it is for you to build that community of voices within the social media channels to promote your games. It's true, I mean, it's true, we, we were one of the early players doing that. I think we started around three years ago contacting influencers and trying to pitch them and to make videos about our, our titles. It's very tough. I have to say that it's very tough because at the end they are celebrities, no? And, and dealing with those celebrities it's very difficult to reach agreements and that they accept. They don't care too much about money because they have tons of money, so they have to love your game to be able to, to make a video. You know? We have a dedicated team of three people. Uh, we have done videos with, with many top celebrities like Banos Gaming, Rosanna Pancino, also with PewDiePie, we did some videos. So it has been a great experience. When, when they push a video, the, the, the amount of users that they push to your game is incredible, and normally with better retention and with better KPIs, which is amazing. But it's a, it's a part of marketing that is very difficult to scale. You have to devote lots of hours, and it's more about creating the long-term relation than looking for short-term results. Cool. Um, I mean, the company has grown uh, tremendously. You went through an acquisition last year from Take Two. Um, can you guys share as much as you can about that process of getting in contact with them? And also, what type of win-win uh, relationships are, are you developing now? Because obviously they, they come from gaming, very strong on that vertical, but not that they, they don't know much about mobile, right? So how did you get in touch with them, and at what point did you find the value of partnering uh, with Take Two? So there was a time like two years ago that we started receiving offers from gaming companies to to, to think on the possibility of, of partnering with them, but and you, we didn't find them very interesting because. We were really profitable and we keep working independently many years. But when they approach us, we saw a really good opportunity to, to learn from them and to make something even bigger from them. So we were very happy at what uh, Fossil Shopping was doing, but why not the next five to ten years uh, do something even bigger inside the Take Two family? You know? And after knowing each other more, we saw the way that they were working, uh, it fitted a lot with our culture, and then we thought it was a good next step for Social Point and for everybody you know, working at Social Point. And I have to say that now it has been uh, a year and two months, I think, since uh, we joined them. And one of the greatest things that Take Two has is that they operate uh, with a lot of uh, independence from every student and every library. So they try to help you and support you when you need it, but they don't, they help, they, they, they don't try to involve themselves into decision making on the portfolio strategy on how to operate the games because at the end, every studio they know better than everybody. Uh, of all the operate of all to become successful. So that's very good. So for good and for bad, we are still the same company as, as uh, one year ago. And the synergy is very clear, and Take Two is the three biggest company in PC and console gaming in the world, and they have one of the best games in, in the history. And uh, in mobile, they are just starting now, uh, and eventually they want to become a top five mobile uh, developer also. So we are trying to help them as much as we can in order to, to, to launch the best games in mobile and also to become 
probably be better. All right, so let's look forward. What is this five-year plan for Social Point now that you're part of the Take Two family? What, what are you expecting to? What should we be expecting uh, to happen from Social Point? As much as you can share. I don't. I don't have concrete games or or, or but uh, we are still creating our own IPs and, and and there's going to be a lot of new games that we we'll launch in the next two years and we will support uh, Take Two to, to work in their mobile games also in order to make them as successful as possible. So. Perfect. Um, before we open it up uh, to, to the audience, I have to ask you, obviously you said that you have a, a team of 360 uh, people, everyone based in Barcelona. What have been the opportunities and challenges that you've faced, uh, faced in the past for being based in Barcelona, and have you been tempted of, of moving uh, outside outside Spain, outside Barcelona? I don't know. I think because we were born there, or our DNA was always uh, being there, and one of our challenges or, or motivations was to let's try to put Barcelona in the map as one gaming hub. No? And we were the first big uh, gaming company there, and thanks to us, I think right now there is a hub of 15. 20 companies in Barcelona, some of them pretty big, like King or like uh, Gameloft, for example, and, and that's something that we are very proud of, to have contributed into, into that way. Challenges, so look, Barcelona is a really good pool of talent. Uh, there is uh, great developers, there is great artists. Maybe the, the only thing uh, of the part is missing is this, for example, uh, game designers with 20 years experience making games. So, of course, because the industry has been more growing in the last few years, there is no people with 10 to 50 years experience. But at the end, this industry that changes that fast and what uh, learning fast and uh, having great ideas is most important, it's not a big deal. And also, I think Barcelona has been positive for us because there is a lot of people around Europe that uh, they, they like the idea of living in Barcelona because of the, of the quality of life. So you, you've been able to recruit people from all over Europe and probably even further uh, than Europe uh, yeah. and, and they will happily to Barcelona. Good, awesome. So with that, I'm gonna open it up to the audience if there are any questions. Yes. Hi, so it's been about five years since you guys released your first game on mobile. Now, are there any other platforms that you guys are keeping your eyes on besides mobile for the future? So, we have thought sometimes to if we should uh, launch one of our games in our platform like consoles or PC, but we try to, to get focused uh, a lot into, into mobile. Now, I particularly like a lot of the Nintendo Switch, I think they have done a great job, and I think uh, mobile and, and console gaming, they are they will fuse a little bit into the future. I don't know if in the Switch or in other consoles, no? So, when we see that there is a console or the device that can reach much audience, because at the end, our games, they need a minimum of 300,000 views in order to, to be really profitable, and we'll, we'll, we'll think on, on the launch. For example, we discarded VR like two, three years ago, because we thought that maybe it will become a little bit niche in terms of views. So even if you have it at home, maybe you will not use it every day. And our games are based in, in, in the daily usage. So we need to find platforms or, or, or devices that uh, people use it in a daily basis. Would you say now is the moment to focus on VR or is it still not the moment? We are agnostic uh, <laughs> with VR. We don't believe it's uh, uh, the key uh, of the uh, future in terms of gaming. I think VR will work for other things before, other applications. Maybe, I don't know, for real estate or for uh, healthcare, I don't know. But for gaming, I don't see people playing in a daily basis or in a, the right frequency to VR. It's more about an um, experience every three months, maybe, but not, not a something that you play uh, a lot. Okay. Any other questions? Hey, sorry, uh, I, I may have missed the part that I think the, the, the whole thing you have been acquired or not, for now. The, it has been acquired. Yeah. How long does it like? How long does it take you to like begin from scratch to get acquired? How long in your experience? Since this time we met the two until the, the deal was closed, it was around six months, five months. Five months right after you get started. I know the company. The company. No, that was uh, 
Nine years. Nine years. Nine, nine years. Okay. We started how, in 2008. Okay. How was the experience? It's like, you know, it, you know, it's down, well, I mean, I guess it's a tough question, it's a tricky question, but down to the negotiation of, you know, okay, like details of acquisition, how, was that a player, was, was that a pleasant experience or is it a tough one? No, I have to say it, it was intense. Of course, it's something important and you want to do it right and, and to, to make uh, the negotiation work uh, for both parts. I think it was easy. Uh, since the very moment, first moment, we knew each other what we wanted. We had the same vision for the long term, which was very important for, for us and for them because it was not just, we were not looking for a deal of, hey, we make it and then we disappear. We wanted a deal where we were able to keep growing to such a point and, and, and building a long term relation. So, it was easy. Uh, of course, it was intense because this is a lot of things that you have to negotiate from all perspectives and from all angles. But uh, I think uh, it was okay. So, no concerns from my part. How about that um, compared to the, the fund reading in the beginning? So, before you acquired, did you read any fund? Like, in the beginning, you were. If we raised money, money? If we raised money? I mean, yeah. fund reading. Yeah. So, we so, raised it. Uh, Series A round in 2011, really small, 2 million, I think. And in 2012, then we reached 10 more. And that was all. So we all only raised 12 million because then we became profitable and we even needed more on money. And that 2 million was after how many games you have developed by then? One. Ah. Yes, yeah, social empires. Ah. Round City was just after the, the first uh, this, this round. Or two games, sorry, we had two games, but one was very successful. Last one. So, how do you foresee the gaming market in the next, um, like, say, five years, like, in the near future? Because, you know, nowadays there are so many indie game developers, but the, the bigger heads, like, they are dominating the, uh, they are dominating the market, I think. Like, I think it has been demonstrated that uh, the creativity doesn't come from, from size. Let's say, Anybody can have a great idea and can develop it today really fast, for example, with Unity that comes a lot. So we're going to still see uh, really small companies, really small studios having great ideas and launching them, achieving the top 100 person ranking. And then, of course, maybe there is consolidation because there is big companies that they acquire them. But I think the, the market is in a really interesting moment uh, and because uh, people are learning how to innovate and how to launch really uh, surprising ideas, uh, there is a lot of potential I'm seeing. I will say more creativity to the small companies or into the small studios than in the big companies. I think big companies they try to play a little bit more safe and to make games that they can make sure that they are going to make some money. Where let's say small teams, because they don't have nothing to lose, they go a little bit more crazy and then they have a bigger reward. So I think there is still a lot of space for the uh, developers, especially mobile. And we are seeing every year at least. Uh, five new players which appears from nothing and they become really big. So that's, I think that's something really, really good. Thank that's you. why we try to keep social point teams as small and, and to give them this independence to work with. Hi, um, we are also in Barcelona and Tila. I think you guys started there. Um, and my question is, I mean, it's also from Maria and Pepe, honestly, it's, a, it's very good to be here. For us, you're also an example. Like I guess that the next step for you guys is, is social point. But my question is, what are the things that you guys did wrong, and what are the things that you did right to become social point? Well, hard question. We did a lot of mistakes and some good decisions. No? So good decisions is that um, we all, I think. We saw where the market will grow and we try to be there. No? The second is that we try to be original and launch uh, new games that can attract a lot of people. And the third one is that I think we learned to manage and create our creative teams in a way that they were able to, to, to build their best and to support them. If you have these three things and you have passions and you are persistent and uh, you are a little bit luck, because uh, I think in life and in business you need to be always a little bit luck. Yeah, I think uh, you can be successful. So these are these are the right things. And mistakes, but well, all mistakes they came from here. So. <laughs> <laughs> mistakes a lot. But one to add to the three, to the three points that you mentioned, one fourth point that we did a lot was to focus. So we knew from the beginning that we couldn't do everything. Uh, so we decided to focus in very few things, very few game types, and to be persistent. 
so we think that by trying, 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 we, we gain more knowledge and at the end, we achieve the success to tell us. Any other questions? All right, well, thank you so much, Horacio and Andres. Big round of applause for them. Thank you.